Greetings people, it's Paul at Greenshire Homestead. Uh, we got a new camera. We were having problems with the audio and, and the video on the other one. It was turning everything purple for some reason and you couldn't hear me very well. So uh, I'm going to reshoot a couple of videos. I was specifically asked to reshoot the one on the solar panels. Um, this is a 7.9 kilowatt solar array. It's got 20 panels. It's 12 feet tall, 35 feet wide. It sits behind this 30 foot, 30 foot shop. So uh, you don't really see it from the house. Uh, it was twenty-four thousand dollars, fully installed, and we on uh, we got we had a thirty percent tax credit on that, so we got seventy-two hundred dollar check back from the government. The uh, tax credit now uh, dropped to twenty-six uh, percent, so you would get a check for twenty-six percent back from the government. Um, that that's not part of your tax return. That's that's just free and clear of your tax return, you, you'll, you'll get that. It doesn't matter what your tax return is. Um, originally, I would have wanted to put these up on the, the, the shop. That was my original intention. But uh, you have to uh, sweep the snow off of these if, if you want to continue to produce power um, while, while it's snowing or right after it's snowing because uh, they will not produce any power with snow on them. The snow's not going to hurt them. But you, it's just like throwing a tarp over it. They're not going to produce any power at all. So I just take a push broom, I go across the top, and then, uh, you know, I, and then I just come back through and I pull it, um, get the snow cleared off. That way, when it's done snowing and the clouds thin out a little bit, um, we're back to developing uh, power. We have not had an electric bill in almost three years. Uh, this is mid January and um, in April. Uh, will be three years since we've had our last electric bill. That does not include the service charge or meter fee or maintenance fee, whatever you want to call that. We're on an electric co-op. It's a rural electric co-op. And our service fee is $46.50 every month. What that pays for is the uh, guys that work on the power lines, <clears throat> pays for their salary and their equipment. So if an ice storm takes out the power lines and they come out to repair it, or just general maintenance throughout the year, uh, or installing new new power lines. That's that's what that 4650 pays for. So it's money well spent. Doesn't matter how many credits you build up, you still have to pay the the service fee. On a metropolitan electric company, usually your service fee is going to be about twenty five dollars. So a big difference there. Um, also, with the rural electric companies, you know at least at least ours and the ones I know of around here, they only give you thirty percent credit for what you send to the grid. So as you're developing power with your solar panels, whatever you're not using in your house at the time you're developing the power, you're, you're, you're feeding the grid that power, and uh, they give you credit for that. Well, if we send, for instance, nine kilowatts to the grid, we only get credit for three. So one-third of what we're sending we get credit for, and yet we still have not had a bill in almost three years. The What, what you use the credits for is on... Those days, are, it's typically going to be in the winter. You know, these do fine in the winter. They produce plenty of power in the winter. The last three days, we have generated three times the amount of power we have used. So there, there's kind of a misnomer that these don't do well in the winter time, but I, I'm, I'm going to assure you they do. They won't do as well as they do in the spring and summer and early fall, uh, and that's primarily because of the heavy cloud cover we'll have here in the Midwest during the winter time. Um, the the optimum time that you're going to collect power is going to be from 10 to 2. So it doesn't matter if it's July or January, between 10 and 2, these things are just gluttonous, just just eating power like crazy. So you're, you're going to be sending power to the grid during that time period, and that's when you're going to build up your credits. But the credits are kind of like money in the bank. When you do use the grid, such as on a heavy cloud cover day, on 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 a regular cloud cover day, you're still going to produce power. Not quite as much as you would if it was a clear day, but you're still going to produce power. But on those really, really heavy cloud days, you're, you're going to produce a minimal amount of power, and you're going to be using more power from the grid. So that's when you're using your credits, is, or at night. When you're taking power from the grid, rather than having to pay for that power, you're burning through your credits. You don't need to keep track of that. The electric company or electric um, co-op will keep track of that and it'll it'll be reflected in your bill. I still read the meter every day though. Every morning when I get up, one of the first things I do right after I feed the chickens is I read the meter. That's why I know the last three days we produced three times the amount of power we used. Um, 
you, you will want to start reading your meter because <clears throat> that will help you in developing your, your skills at lowering your, your energy consumption. So you and your wife are sitting around and uh, you've been kind of thinking about it and you decide we, we want to look into the solar panel thing. So what's the first step? Well, just either call a friend who's got solar panels and find out who put theirs in and see if they were happy with them or else just get online and find an electric company. They're, I mean a, a solar installation company. There's a whole bunch of them now. It's starting to get real popular. Call them, say you'd like to get some information. They'll send a rep to your house. He does have to come to your house because he's he's got to look at your terrain and your house and your situation. Because uh, once he decide, figures out what size array you're going to need, he, you know you got to see if you can get that in. He also needs to look at trees and stuff like that. Because if you got a lot of trees that are going to throw shadows on these, uh, unless you're going to cut those trees down, there's no point in even getting them. Um, that that's going to be an issue for some of you, uh, but say that's not an issue and, and you, you want to go ahead and get solar panels so you call the, the company and they send a rep out. The rep sits down there at the kitchen table with you, gets his computer out, he's contact, already contacted your electric company because he's going to get your name and address and that, that information. He's going to contact your electric company, find out exactly how much power you use in a year and then he's going to plug all that in with his computer and he's going to sit down he's going he's to give you a full uh, playbook of how this is going to work for you, for your particular home. And then you're going to be able to make an educated decision as to whether or not this is financially viable for you. After he figures out what size array you're going to need, you know, you can go outside and kind of walk around and decide, well, where would we put this array? Would it be on an outbuilding or on our house or in the yard? I mean, a combination thereof, you know, this sort of thing. And you can also decide if, if because of your energy consumption, the array is just way too big uh, for, for what you're comfortable with. You can put in an array that will reduce your bills by 50% or 75. You don't need to go 100 like we did. This array is very small, and yet it's, it's producing more power than we need because my wife and I only use 7 to 9 kilowatt hours a day. The average home in America is using 28 to 30. So we're using about a third of what the average home is. Therefore, this is about a third the size. When you're out and about, you know, taking care of business and you see solar panel arrays, you're usually going to see ones that are, that are three or four times the size of this. This was 24,000. You've got to start getting three or four times the size of this. You know, you're, you're, you're talking about a lot more money. Um, <clears throat> I'm not saying it's going to be three or four times as much, but I'm saying it is going to cost. The average house is going to pay a lot more than twenty-four thousand because you're going to need more than twenty panels. Um, now you're also probably your your electric bill is higher than ours, so the the opportunity for you to lower that electric bill goes goes up exponentially. It, you know, a lot of people are paying three to five hundred dollars a month for their electric bill. We were paying one hundred and thirty before um, we installed this. Um, on average, about 120 to 130 dollars a month, not including the service fee. So, of oh, 46.50, that was just our electric bill. Um, so, if your electric bill is, you know, three, four, or 500 dollars a month, just putting in a system that will cover half of that will be a tremendous savings for you. So that you know, that's something you might want to think about. The other thing with solar panels, people, you know, they, people have ideas of of how these things work and People, a lot of people will think that, okay, uh, you know, you've, you've decided to go ahead and get, let, let me get back to something. You've decided to go ahead and get the solar panels. The rep is here and you've figured out what you're going to do. What do you do next? Well, you got to contact your electric company. The electric company is going to send you some paperwork you have to fill out. It's no big deal. It's just, just little details um, about the solar company that's putting it in and, and just, just minimal stuff. No big deal. They just need to understand that you're going to be doing this. Then you need to check with your building codes or homeowners association, that sort of thing, and see if there's any kind of rules uh, about or against solar panels. So assuming that there isn't any or, or you fall within those parameters and everything's okay and you've gotten a pass from your so association or the governing body of your, your community so, and you can go ahead and put the solar panels in, the solar company comes out, they put it all in, everything's up and running. Uh, or ready to be up and running, 
The, the last thing you have to do is notify the electric company that the entire grid has been installed and everything's ready, and then they'll send a guy out to uh, inspect it to make sure that everything is done to their specifications because you're going to be feeding their grid. They need to, they need to double check and make sure everything was done uh, to, to their satisfaction. It took the guy about 10 minutes when he came out to look at ours. He was here about 10 minutes. He said, it looks great, and he threw the switch. He slapped me on the back and he smiled and he said, you're ahead of us now, but we're going to catch you, you know, and they caught us for three or four months, but we've been sailing right ahead of them ever since. So uh, the guy will come out and inspect it. And once he does, he'll throw the switch and then you're up and running and that's it. You just sit back. You don't have to do anything. You, you don't have to do anything at all. There's, there's zero maintenance other than sweeping the snow off. Uh, and you don't have to do that. I do, but you don't have to. And we're going to be going off grid. We're, we're currently grid tied solar, but we are going to be going off grid. So we're making a lot of preparation work for that sort of thing and keeping these things clean uh, of snow is one of them. Um, you know, the walls of this shop are 14 feet and that's why we didn't put it up there because being up on a metal roof, walking around on the snow, 14 feet in the air is a good way to either end up in the, uh, you know, trying to clean these solar panels off. It's a good way to either end up in the ER or the uh, funeral home, one of the two. So that's why we put them where we did. And it's worked out really well. <clears throat> so you've got the panels, you're up and running, your electric bill is either zero or cut way back. And you're really happy about that. Um, and, and you're thinking, okay, now if there's a power outage, you know, we're still going to have power, we're good to go. And that's not the case. You, if the grid goes down, you go down with it. Um, that's just the way it is. I could give you a lot of details on that, but I'm not gonna because all you need to know is these are not gonna work if the grid is down, okay? In order for these to work while the grid's down, when the grid's down, you're off grid. So in order for these to work while the grid's down, you have to build an off grid system. And I've seen a lot of advertising for that kind of thing where I, I, I quite honestly don't believe that's going to be a good idea for the average family because our off-grid system is going to be 15 kilowatt. I'm going to buy enough batteries to store 15 kilowatt hours. Uh, that's going to run $12,000. The charge controller that controls the power that's going into those batteries is going to run about $800. But the real, the real kicker, and, and this is something everybody has to have, is an inverter. And that inverter inverts the DC power to AC power because that's what your house uses. But it also controls the, amp, the, the amps that are going to your appliances because when your appliances kick on, they draw a lot of power. Kind of like when you turn your key and your ignition on your car, there's a lot of drain on the battery to, to, to spin the, the starter and the flywheel and all the different things that are going on. Uh, it really drains the battery down and, and there's a surge of power coming out of that battery to get the engine up and running. Once it's up and running, that, that demand on the battery goes way down. That's how your appliances work. When they first kick on, the, there's, there, the amp requirements are controlled by the inverter. And if that inverter can't feed that power surge to the appliances properly, you're going to burn your appliances up. Collateral damage is going to occur. The amount of collateral damage could be as bad as a fire. I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen. Um, it, it just depends on your situation. So trying to build, you know, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars because, because ours is going to run about 20 grand and we're at 15 kilowatt. Like I said, the average family is 28 to 30, you know, you can pretty well double that. And there's, there's really no reason for it because when the grid's down for a few hours because of an ice storm or a tractor trailer took out a utility pole or whatever it was, um, you're talking a few hours usually. Two, and if that's your concern, is the grid going down temporarily, the best choice would just be go buy a good quality generator, have a qualified electrician come in and install that generator so all you, you know, up to your system, your house, so that all you have to do is pour the gas in and fire it up and then bam, you're up and running. You're, you're talking about three grand there. You're talking tens of thousands of dollars to build a system that's going to run your house while the grid's down. Don't get sucked into something like that. Generator for temporary power usage is you're going to be your best option. Um, so, uh, getting getting back, uh, you know, so you're you're not going to have power when the panels are down. Okay, for the most part, that's not going to be a big deal because it's usually just a couple hours. Um, but 
as soon as the grid comes back up, these are back up. You don't have to do anything. It's just like any other time there's been a power outage, the power comes back on. And I mean, if you, you know, because you walk in rooms and turn lights on and forget, and then all of a sudden the lights are on, you're like, oh, the power's back on. That, you don't need to do anything. Once, once the grid comes back up, you're going to be up and running again. You just need to understand that while the grid's down, solar panels aren't going to work for you unless you've got an off-grid system. Now, <clears throat> so, um, I think that actually pretty well covers it. Um, the only other thing I could I could add to it, I mean, I, I, we've gone over, you know, what 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 they'll do, what they won't do, uh, how to go about getting getting them installed, and then you know, once they are installed, try to you know read that meter, kind of get used to what is going on when the when the meter's spinning backwards, you're sending power to the grid. When the meter's not moving at all, that means you're sitting idle. You're not receiving power from the grid or sending power to the grid, uh, you know, because the sun's lower in the sky, you know, such as now. The sun is low in the sky, so that meter's probably sitting still right now. Um, and when the meter's spinning forward, that means you're taking power from the grid. So, you know, look at your meter frequently, if not every day, and you'll, you'll start to pick up on ideas on, on lowering your energy needs. Like, uh, Incandescent light bulbs, they absolutely suck. Those, those things eat power like nobody's business. Replace all your incandescent bulbs and all your fluorescent bulbs with LED bulbs. The fluorescent bulbs aren't nearly as bad as the, as the incandescents, but the LEDs are way better than, than the uh, fluorescents. You'll see a difference just by doing that. And try to take shorter showers because if you have an electric water heater, water does not heat efficiently. And it, it, it it, it doesn't hold heat well. It wants to get rid of that heat. So get an insulating blanket, put it around your uh, water heater, and try and take shorter showers. You know, I, I, you know, I turn the water on and get wet, turn it off, soap up, and then rinse off. It takes me about four gallons of water to shower. I, I know a lot of people aren't going to do that, but uh, that saves water. And it also saves you a tremendous amount of energy just, just doing little things. And it, if, if you can, do your laundry. When, you know, or you can you can put the clothes in the wash anytime, but when you're going to run your dryer, wait till that sun is is between that 10 and 2, because the dryer, the clothes dryer, if it's an electric clothes dryer, it sucks a lot of power. So if you do it while the the sun is at its optimal, you'll be drying your clothes with the sun rather than using the grid. So little things like that will help a lot, um, and you'll you'll start to develop your own skills on on what what you can do to re, you know diminish your your energy needs and lower your carbon footprint. It's good for you because it costs you less money and it's good for the nation um, because you know we didn't, we do have an energy crisis. I think everybody's pretty well aware of that. They're gonna burn less coal. I mean, the more people that do this, the less coal they're gonna have to burn and, and it, it's, they're gonna have to build less substations. They're gonna have to do less maintenance on the substations. Just, it's just a big win-win. So take that leap of faith look into it, actually make contact with a solar installation company and ask them to come out, sit down at the kitchen table with you and just tell you what it would cost and how much you would have to, um, what size array you would have to have and see where you can put that. It's Paul Greenshire Homestead. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time at Greenshire.